Um, all right. So um, hopefully everyone here got to be a part of our interesting case conference this morning. Um, it was great to have Dr. Laporte here to offer advice on how to manage some complex um, hand issues that that we have and, and can get her advice on it. But um, for those of you who don't know Dr. Laporte, she's a current um, residency director at Hopkins and has been so for 15 years. Um, but that's just the beginning of it, like the most impressive CV. She is um, me on steroids and she's who I want to be when I um, continue my career. And um, she has so many teaching awards when you look at her CV. She has been a part of every, um, probably every society in hand surgery from hand surgery to ACGME to um, head of uh, some cord um, and residency directors and um, has really helped change the um, way that we look at education for orthopedics, how we teach our residents, how we teach our medical students, um, and continues to have innovations in education. Um, and she's going to talk to us today on innovations in orthopedic education. So I think that um, this is great that we have you here today, and we're so honored to have you, and thank you for coming. And without further ado, let me turn it over to you. Thank you so much for that nice introduction, and thank you to Dr. Lamson and Dr. Schroeder and Dr. Vale uh, for inviting me. It's a true honor to be here with all of you. Um, I'm going to talk about innovations in orthopedic education, and I have no relevant disclosures other than that I still don't really know the best way to teach surgical skills, but we're going to talk about some options. I'm going to talk briefly about uh, the history of surgical education some innovations in teaching orthopedic knowledge, focus uh, primarily on teaching surgical skills, and then talk a little bit at the end about some AI applications that may change uh, the future of medical education. So first, you know, how did we get here? And mutual accountability, continuous feedback, and graduated responsibility are the pillars on which the apprenticeship model was built, which was surgical residency when it was first introduced at the turn of the 20th century in this country by Dr. William Halstead at Johns Hopkins. And mutual accountability was based on intense daily interaction and interdependence. And uh, there was saturated clinical exposure in the pre-duty hour era. And this led to ample opportunity for practice and repetition, and then progression to autonomy and graduated responsibility. And for its time, it was very effective uh, at training generations of accomplished and innovative surgeons. But fast forward, um, and in 2009, Dr. Richard Bell, in his presidential address to the Central Surgical Society, uh, talked about why Johnny cannot operate. And he said that the teaching and learning in the operating room is poorly understood and assessed. And we know that there are challenges to the apprenticeship model from both the resident and the faculty side. Residents are spread incredibly thin. Uh, there's constantly expanding knowledge and skill sets that you're responsible for, multiple rotations, multiple sites, growing numbers of faculty, variability and unpredictability of case experience, all in the setting of less time um, with duty hour regulation. And we know there's more um, information than you can possibly learn in an 80 hour work week, and there are a ton of responsibilities in the quote non working hours. And at the end of the day, uh, when you finish your residency, everybody has to pass their boards. From the faculty side, there's just less time for teaching. We're mandated to see more patients and be more clinically efficient. There are uh, increasing safety initiatives and regulation, and there's a seemingly uh, decreased availability of OR time and resources. But ultimately, our responsibility as orthopedic educators is to teach a solid base of orthopedic knowledge and uh, competency in technical skills so that when residents graduate, they can practice independently without supervision and can pass their boards. So again, there's that uh, constantly expanding base of knowledge um, that we're responsibility to teach and you're responsible to learn. Programs should have a longitudinal curriculum, possibly a two-year rotating curriculum so that residents see it as a junior resident and then get to repeat as a more senior resident. There are many different learning styles, and so the format for teaching and knowledge should be varied, maybe with a focus on a flipped classroom or interactive key space studies um, or teaching with a just-in-time focus. There should be a structured reading curriculum, maybe by subspecialty or rotation, 
so that trainees don't waste a lot of time just figuring out what they should be reading. And fortunately, there are some new uh, great knowledge resources that have some interactive components. Knowledge should be assessed serially and not just once a year on the orthopedic in-training exam. And this allows um, for making learners accountable, but also helps learners know how they um, are faring compared to their peers and if they're at the right expected level um, for their PGY year. Uh, it also helps to identify strengths and weaknesses so you know where to focus on the majority of your effort. And fortunately, there are some areas of innovation that have um, helped to optimize learning the knowledge base of orthopedics. So um, Ancaneus is a proprietary uh, machine learning algorithm of orthobullets, and it helps to identify strengths and weaknesses based on the learner's interactions with the orthobullets content. And so it can repeat content and questions that you don't know as well for spaced repetition to augment your learning. Um, JBJS Clinical Classrooms also has an adaptive learning platform. Um, and when you answer questions in clinical classrooms, you have to say, I know the material, I think I know it, I'm unsure, or I have no idea. And it combines that information with how quickly you answer the question um, to then feedback material that you don't know as well and steer you away from spending a lot of time on the stuff that you do know. And the system learns as the user learns more too, so it adapts with you. And so that can be really helpful for self-directed learning. And it can also be helpful on the program level to direct individual education as well as program-wide. And then um, I threw the SAIL in there. SAIL stands for a Socratic Artificial Intelligence Learning. And this is an app uh, that we developed with two of our really tech-savvy residents and a couple undergraduate students. Um, and what it does is it allows the user to verbally answer a question for an orthopedic flashcard and then get an audio response. So it's like having a conversation uh, with a virtual assistant, kind of like a Google assistant. And uh, there's background literature that shows that having the verbal or audio component can help be a boost to memory. And this is Herman Ebbinghaus, who was a psychologist who described the forgetting curve. And he also talked about something called encoding distinctiveness. Um, and this means that the more sort of sensory components that are part of your learning process, um, the higher the boost to your memory will be. So if you have to type in the answer, you get a little bit of a boost to memory. If you have to say the answer and you hear about additional feedback, that pushes you further on the um, memory curve. And our initial study uh, with this sale uh, app has shown that the voice modality did produce uh, the most robust recall. So more work to be done on that, but it may be an opportunity to augment the knowledge learning and also give an opportunity to do orthopedic studying on the run like, with your headsets. So uh, shifting gears um, to surgical skills, there's been increasing attention uh, to the importance of real-time feedback uh, for surgical skills and performance. Like Dr. Lanson just mentioned, this is a screenshot of the ABOS surgical skills app, which I know you're all familiar with. Um, however, on the teaching and assessment of skills side, orthopedic still remains behind, uh, certainly compared to the aviation industry, but also general surgery. Orthopedics uh, traditionally has little dedicated practice or task deconstruction, breaking down surgeries to their component parts, um, and no objective measure of success or competency. Um, although there's definitely been increased attention to surgical training and proficiency assessment, especially uh, in the duty hour regulation era. And this uh, picture in the corner is Chesley Sullenberger, or Sully, who was the U.S. Airlines pilot who uh, safely landed his plane in the Hudson, saving all of his passengers and crew. And he attributes his ability to do that successfully to spending a lot of time on a virtual simulator, which will be relevant to some of the things we're going to talk about. Uh, Dr. Uh, K. Anders Erickson is a psychologist who talked about the importance of deliberate practice um, and that it takes 10,000 or more hours to become an expert. And then using this as background, Dr. Uh, ben Pellegrini, who's an orthopedic surgeon, uh, wrote about the substantial decrease in uh, hours available for training with duty hour regulations and that more time is needed. There's not enough time in the current system to achieve the appropriate knowledge base and proficiency uh, in orthopedics and independent practice for surgery. And so we need to think outside of the box and how can we um, move people further along on the learning curve. So we circled back uh, to Dr. Richard Bell, and he gave some suggestions. Um, and one was increasing the use of simulators in surgical teaching. Uh, 
he also interestingly looked at the faculty and resident perspective of what's imp important for learning in the OR. Um, and I don't know if this comes across, but you can see that the uh, resident's perspective was almost a complete inverse of the faculty perspective. So there may be a role uh, for increasing communication and understanding as well. So how do we get there? How do we make up this gap? And um, I think that there's a big role for simulation and possibly some of the innovations in VR and AR. And programs have moved away from the Halsteadian model of teaching towards a competency-based training. Uh, and this probably includes some form of simulation. So instead of the old uh, Halsteadian adage, see one, do one, teach one, um, I think there's more of a premise of see one, practice a lot, and then go to the OR better prepared. Uh, so even though uh, we're talking about it a lot more lately, simulation is not new. Uh, it does provide an opportunity for practice away from the patient, so it's safer. It allows um, for repetition and making errors and learning from that. It's available almost any time, and uh, it is data-driven. Surgical simulation has its roots in general surgery. Um, and we go back to Seymour, who randomized uh, trainees to a laparoscopic simulator, or traditional teaching, and showed that the simulator-trained group uh, dissected the gallbladder significantly faster, had significantly less errors, um, and was more likely to progress. And this was over 20 years ago. And I think most of us are familiar with the fundamentals of laparoscopic surgery and the impact that that has had on teaching and also accreditation in general surgery. So traditionally, um, teaching of surgical skills has been mostly a technical skills-based approach, um, but there's some increasing attention to a cognitive task analysis approach. Um, and this breaks down a procedure into its cognitive steps with a focus on decision-making. And there are a few stages of this that are important to consider um, when we talk about how we're going to teach surgical skills. Um, so the first stage of learning a complex procedure, according to Fitz and Posner, is cognition. And in this stage, uh, the learner understands the procedure and can describe the steps. And they move into the integration phase where they're incorporating the understanding uh, with the appropriate motor behavior. They still have to think about the steps, but they're progressing through uh, with more fluidity. And ultimately, they get to automation uh, where they no longer have to think about the steps. So the cognition piece is there and then they're performing the tasks with greater speed and efficiency and precision. So you know, teaching somebody to do a surgery and teaching a procedure is complicated. And that's where I think some of this learning theory is helpful. And so this is a framework um, for acquisition of complex skills. And there's five stages and the learner has to progress through each of these stages. Um, and I would propose, and I think most people would agree that you don't want the learners ideally performing that first stage, that learn stage, on a patient in the operating room, right, for the first time. So our goal as educators is to gradually build the learners so that when they're in the OR, they're further on the learning curve and they're maybe at that prove and do stage. And so this is where, this is where technology, I think, can be really helpful. Um, it can help get the learners through those first three phases um, through a concept known as mental rehearsal. Um, so you're practicing, and then when you get there and you're doing the real thing, you have a comfort level, you know the steps, um, and you're at a better point to learn and get the most out of being in the operating room, and you're safer. Um, so that's great, right? We can just give you the technology and tell you to learn, and then we'll be in good shape. But that's not exactly how it works. There has to be some thought that goes into that. Um, and I think an important additional learning theory tenet is that learners of different levels and experience have different needs, right? So teaching a PGY-1 is different than teaching a PGY-5. And if we don't appropriately target these different levels, it can lead to cognitive overload and that interferes with the you know, efficacy or how well you're doing as a teacher. So um, as orthopedic educators are teaching uh, trainees at different levels from novices, ideally to experts and people who are graduating in a month here, which is great. Um, and the needs of those are different. Uh, and I'm not sure that our current learning resources consider this. So I think this is important. Um, and so our one-size-fits-all education methods um, are, are not optimal. Um, and they may be too complex for the novices, and they may be too basic for experts. So we have to think about how we can balance this um, and if the technology resources can help. And one way to visualize this is with this kind of classic yerkes dodson curve, um, which talks about optimizing performance. And so ideally, as an educator, you want to present moderate complexity material with a goal of optimizing performance. And when you strike just that right balance, um, your learner 
uh, gets in an area of cognitive flow, which is like being in the zone. And so you want to provide the resources for your learner uh, to be in the zone, kind of like Steph Curry when he broke the three-point record. And this um, cognitive load theory was first described by Justin Sewell, who was faculty here at UCSF. And this is the last uh, theory slide, but cognitive load um, in emphasizes the importance of the intrinsic load, which is the complexity of the actual new information, minimizing the extraneous load. So those are distractions. Um, and all of that leads to optimizing the germane load, which is what you're truly learning. And so can you actually change the complexity of that new information? Not directly, but you can know where your learner is at and you can break it down. Um, and so the, even though it's the same material, you can present it in different ways on uh, to different levels of learner. Um, and one way to do that is sequencing where you teach components of the procedure or components of, of the concept and then build on that. Um, and simulation is a great opportunity for that. Um, so you want to teach in a low fidelity environment that helps to minimize the extraneous load. You don't have the stress of the operating room. You don't have the time constraints. Um, you don't have people coming in every, 15 minutes to say, when are you going to be done? Because the next surgeon wants your room. Um, and then you can teach by these component parts. And that can be done with videos, simulation, mobile apps, and even cadaveric dissections, because typically we're operating through a very small window and having the broader dissection gives um, early learners that perspective of where everything is, uh, again, in a safe environment. Uh, so what, you know, what is simulation? Simulation is, you know, uh, some real thing. Um, so it replicates the actual surgery or the procedure, um, but it allows the opportunity to practice and repeat, to make errors and get immediate feedback and then go back in there and see how you can do it differently or better. It's learner-centered instead of patient-centered, which is you know a different paradigm than in the operating room. Um, and it can have objective measurable uh, components. So you can be assessed with an OSAT or a global rating scale or uh, with asset for arthroscopy. And it moves the learner further along the learning curve. So they're you know better prepared when they get to the operating room and they get more out of that really valuable OR uh, learning opportunity. Um, and you can uh, follow their progress through um, these evaluations and data, um, and you can compare where they're at compared to what their level should be. So there are a number of different simulation modalities. Uh, you can do work on cadavers, sawbones, virtual reality, which we'll talk about, mobile apps. Um, and basically, it, you know, any of these can help you develop skills, but also can help with decision-making with a cognitive component. Um, and ideally, any of these simulators should be uh, valid and a part of the curriculum. So there are a few criteria that are necessary for any good simulator. Uh, they should have face and content. Um, they should have face and content um, validity. Uh, so that they represent the actual procedure. They should be able to distinguish between um, different levels of training, so that's construct validity. And ideally, they should show that learning and doing well on the uh, simulator translates to performance in the operating room, so that's uh, transfer validity. And so one example uh, of a good simulation component is the STEP, or Surgical Training and Education Platform, from the American Society for Surgery of the Hand. The ASSH created a surgical simulation work group, and they identified eight different psychometer tasks that any hand surgeon should be able to do, and then created modules to help teach and then test these psychometer skills. And then they went around the country testing over 90 CAQ uh, hand surgeons, as well as PGY1 trainees, and showed uh, that the modules had construct validity. They could all distinguish between a novice uh, surgeon and an expert. Um, I'll be fair. And here's an example down in the bottom corner of the index box uh, wrist arthroscopy module. And you can see how it can uh, teach and assess uh, for needle localization. And it also has a component to test uh, grasping and transfer um, by moving this washer. Bump a labor. You can have that in your living room, and I am not advancing. There we go. Um, we did additional studies that show tighter construct validity. You can actually show the difference between a junior resident and a senior resident, and it also correlated with uh, relevant case volume. And so right now, uh, the STEP modules are being used in fellowships across the country uh, to 
initially as an initial assessment and then teaching platform and can help identify areas um, for improvement and then ideally for final assessment at the end of fellowship uh, to show improvement. So another area um, that is ideal for surgical simulation is arthroscopy, right? Because arthroscopy skills improve the more that you're doing it. So the more repetition uh, conceptually, the better you are, but practicing in the operating room is not always optimal. Um, and there's a ton of literature on uh, arthroscopy simulators. I'm certainly not going to be uh, extensively inclusive, but the early studies show that practice on the simulator uh, resulted in improved performance on the simulator, but not necessarily in the OR. Uh, but more recent studies, uh, including this meta-analysis and systematic review um, of 57 papers um, from 2018, showed that practice on the simulator not only improved performance on the simulator, but also translatable improved skills into the operating room. And a lower fidelity model, this was a randomized controlled trial using um, a low fidelity triangulation model. Uh, and practice on this showed improvement with the, all of the triangulation tasks that the simulator had but it didn't show improvement on the post-test asset. So um, it didn't necessarily show um, translatable improvement to the OR. Uh, these two papers from Rick Angelo and colleagues, I think tapped into a really important concept. They introduced a proficiency-based progression requirement as part of their simulation training. So they had three groups, one group that was trained with traditional measures, one that had traditional, traditional measures and could use the simulator, but with no requirements. And then their group C had a proficiency-based uh, progression requirement. So they had to meet metrics on the simulator and they saw a significant difference. Their group C, the PVP uh, trained group, performed significantly better on all of the metrics um, than both of the other groups. And so, you know, having this precise feedback, having quantitative benchmarks and having the need to pass before moving forward uh, seemed to make a big difference. Um, they, people that were in that group had uh, completed significantly more steps of the procedure, had less errors, and importantly, had less sentinel errors. Um, so I think that's a really key concept that there needs to be some structure to the simulation and um, ideally incorporation into the curriculum. So simulator uh, training has shown that it can improve performance, not just on the simulator tasks themselves, but also translatable improvement to operative performance. Uh, there still remains issues because many of these simulators are expensive. Um, they're not standardized. Um, and there's definitely a need for additional research uh, and validity. Um, but I think a key point is that some kind of proficiency-based curriculum um, along with a simulator may, uh, may and should increase the value of it and um, lead to that translatable improvement in the OR. So... Um, mobile simulation also provides an opportunity for practice and repetition. It's even more convenient and flexible um, because there are over 250 million smartphone users in the U.S. alone. Um, and it can also um, provide an opportunity to practice um, and decrease time and errors in the operating room. I'm going to talk about touch surgery. I have no um, investment in this. It's just a good example. This is a London-based company uh, that has a smartphone app for multiple different um, specialties. Um, but they have a lot of orthopedic um, procedures and they have high resolution graphics and a learn and a test mode uh, for simulated procedures that residents can or anybody can work through. Um, they have the, you know, a touch screen interaction um, and that been shown to have construct face and content validity. And this is a study out of Rothman where they had three different groups do the carpal tunnel module three times um, and they found that with each successive time going through the module, there was improvement. Um, and ultimately, the more junior trainees found this to be the most valuable, so more valuable for residents than for faculty. We use um, the Touch Surgery, uh, which is a CTA-based um, app, before our intern boot camp incorporated it with a pre-reading. And all of our PGY1s who did it felt that it improved their baseline understanding of the procedures. It accelerated the rate of learning in the OR, uh, in the lab because they were more comfortable with the steps um, and made the procedures easier to learn. Um, and they all thought it was pretty fun too. Um, these are some screenshots. This one's showing the testing mode with multiple choice options. And this shows the um, slide mechanism for progressing through the procedure. Um, yeah, I mentioned incorporating it into intern skills. 
I think it can also be incorporated onto rotations. I would encourage using the learn mode first and then the test mode. There are over 20 uh, orthopedic procedures on there that may uh, even be close to 30 now. This is an example of the lab screw module. I think you add that a minimum you can require a basic passing score before the lab. We used 80% as a passing score. But um, that way, before you get to the lab and you're working through, for example, doing a lag screw, you know what the steps are and you're not fumbling with that part. Then you can focus more on the psychomotor component of it. Um, you can require the modules by rotation. You can do that intermedullary nail modules for trauma or the supracondylar humerus fracture um, before the PEDS rotation. Um, and ideally, you could encourage practice and testing before the operating room. I'm going to just run a video of this carpal tunnel module and the LIM nail module. Um, and you know, what it does, it lets the trainee run through the steps, but it also makes them think about the procedure and it may prompt a discussion uh, with the resident and the attending before the case. And they think that's incredibly valuable. Okay. All right. um, so mobile apps are inexpensive. Touch surgery is free. Um, they're you know, available for practice and repetition. You can do these modules over and again. You can do it during um, turnover times between cases. Um, they will help to decrease that cognition component of preparation. And we know from um, cognitive task analysis that if you have uh, training in one of the elements, um, it, re it decreases the attention required for that. And so if they have a better understanding of the steps and the instruments, um, there's less focus on that component and they can focus on improving the psychomotor or the actual uh, physical skill. Um, and certainly this can move the learner further on the learning curve so that either in the lab or in the hour, they're getting the most out of that learning experience. And just based on feedback and the limited studies that there are, this may be better for more junior level trainees. Um, but I think it's a nice exercise to learn the steps um, and the instruments. So. I think both the simulation and we talked about the mobile app are good opportunities to facilitate mental rehearsal and bring learners through these first three phases of skill acquisition. And you know the, the fifth stage is happening in the OR. So what about that fourth stage? Um, and that can go either way. But one um, opportunity uh, to address that is potentially virtual reality. Um, virtual reality includes a VR headset, which has um, visual and audio components and usually hand controllers uh, that have a sense of touch incorporated. So varying levels of haptics, and, and that's an area uh, for improvement. Um, even though VR is relatively new in surgery, uh, it's been around for decades. Um, and one of the first examples was this virtual interface environment workstation with NASA, which had a VR headset and then had gloves to interact with the virtual environment. Um, there was increased attention to VR uh, in orthopedics and in surgery during the pandemic, where there was this you know, precipitous drop in case volume, um, and people could have these headsets at home and continue uh, orthopedic learning um, remotely. So I think um, that's where there was a big boost and attention to improving uh, this technology. It does um, you know, help address the opportunity to practice in a risk-free setting, um, illegal and patient safety concerns. Um, but it has some unique um, opportunities that we don't have in some of the other simulation that we talked about. You can teach with this, so the faculty member can have a headset on and the trainee can have a headset and the attending can take the resident through that case. And you don't even have to be in the same room. Um, Dr. Schroeder can be in her living room and Tiffany can be in her living room and you can be taking her through you know, a complex distal radius fracture. Or you can even be in different states or countries, which I'll we'll, uh, talk about. Um, you can repeat this to proficiency, unlike a cadaver. This is a, you know, reusable over and over again. Um, and it may move somebody uh, faster to that level of proficiency because you don't have to wait until there are five of the same keys to practice that skill. Um, and then unlike the other modalities, there are haptics, you have that feel component. So you can get to feel what it's like to ream a tibia or um, to put in an acetabular component. There's area for improvement there, um, but that is a definite benefit as well. Um, the uh, VR system is more portable and accessible than many of the other simulators. You, you basically just need the headset and the hand pieces. Um, and it has the opportunity to measure extensive metrics and track that and document that. So you have personal view of your analytics. You can watch your progress. 
um, and you can compare yourself to others and your program can see where you're going as well. So it's a lot. Um, there's an increasing body of literature um, supporting the benefit of virtual reality for education and orthopedics. And we'll talk about some of this. And uh, many of these studies have shown not just the face content and construct validity, validity, but starting to show transfer, transfer validity as well. And I put up a picture of the Kolb's experiential uh, learning theory, which we talked a little bit about last night at Journal Club. Uh, but VR basically provides an endless opportunity to go through the Kolb's experiential learning cycle where, you know, you're practicing, you're getting feedback, you're adjusting, and then you can, you know, rinse and repeat. Um, so uh, the orthopedic literature, as well as other surgical subspecialty literature, um, shows pretty consistently that use of VR um, helps to reduce operative time and reduce errors um, and growing evidence that it improves accuracy. Um, the trainees who uh, learn on the VR have improved anatomic knowledge and have decreased need for intraoperative instruction or guidance um, and come to the OR with a greater comfort level. Uh, this is uh, going back almost 10 years ago, and this is an arthroscopic uh, VR trainer, and this was a multi-center study, including UCSF. Um, and this study showed that training on the VR simulator uh, showed a greater skill level in that group in the operating room compared with the control group that had traditional teaching methods. And then in more recent literature, also looking at VR for arthroscopy, um, shows that transfer validity, as well as significant improvement in specific measured tasks um, for arthroscopy. And then there was a recent study it's in, in Turkey, but interesting, there weren't, aren't many studies that compare VR um, to cadaveric training, which is considered, uh, traditionally considered the gold standard, um, and showed that they were just as effective. So I think that's an area for more research. Um, we looked at the VR Skiffy module, and um, the learners found that that was um, subjectively rated higher um, than uh, learning by video and uh, traditional measures, and they had similar performance on the physical simulator. Uh, the uh, UCLA group also looked at the VR Skiffy module and found that the group that trained on the simulator um, had less in and outs with the pin, less articular penetration, um, and less errors in the OR. Uh, this is a study of looking at the VR tibial nail module, um, and they showed consistently higher scores on all of the global rating scale metrics, um, comparing the VR module to a standard techniques guide. Um, and then this is um, similar tibial nail VR module. This study was done at a university of Illinois. This shows the teaching uh, component of the module where you have prompts and this is the testing module. So there's no prompts um, and they showed increased procedural accuracy and completion. So both a you know, cognitive and a technical skill improvement with a VR over a technique guide in a novice uh, population. Some of the more uh, recent studies have looked at open uh, and more complex surgeries. And so uh, this is a group out of London, Lagasheni, and they looked at teaching anterior approach total hip arthroplasty with a group that had never done um, anterior approach total, total hip arthroplasty. And they did um, six different sessions on the VR simulator and found that by around that sixth time, they were coming close to the uh, faculty group, which they were you know, using as an expert metric. And then they did a um, randomized control trial where one group um, just worked with videos and reading material. And then the VR group uh, worked with the VR module once a week over six weeks. Um, and they showed that the VR trained a group advanced further on the learning curve and were more precise. And they looked at metrics like femoral cut um, and version of the acetabular component. Uh, and a similar uh, randomized controlled trial was done for total, total hip arthroplasty VR at NYU. Um, and they also found significantly better performance, both cognition and technical skills in the VR trained group. And so they're being proponents of that. Um, I think that uh, the tendency was for this to be geared more for more junior residents. But interestingly, a study uh, from Danny Gall and the Canadian uh, Shoulder and Elbow Society looked at senior residents with a more complex uh, skill, um, so preparing the glenoid, and they found that immersive VR um, significantly moved the learner along the learning scale, um, and that they showed transfer validity that the group that trained on the VR 
uh, did better in the uh, in the OR. And they actually quit a 570% reduction in learning time when you look at how many cases it would take. I think that's a stretch, but it was an impressive number. Um, and this is being used all over. So this is a picture from an AO trauma regional course in Latin America using immersive uh, VR along with uh, their sawbones and typical teaching methods. Um, and this is some data from a VR study on unicompartmental and the arthroplasty. Uh, so it's being tested in uh, numerous different uh, complex procedures as well. Another huge value of VR is that there are a ton of metrics that are available. And so as a program director, I can see a dashboard like this. It shows me, you know, these are my residents. I can see how much they're using the system um, and how much time they're spending. I can look at any one resident and see which modules they've done and their progression. An individual will get um, a, a lot of uh, personal analytics. Um, and it goes into a lot of detail. This is for the tibial IM nail module. And it will give you metrics for reaming and for screw placement. It will show how you did on this run, how you've done on previous runs, and how you compare to your peers. Um, you can look at a program view um, and see this sort of gradual progression meter and see how everyone's doing overall. And they have this gamified mastery meter. So this purple color will gradually progress from left to right um, as you get better and better at the VR um, module and procedure. Um, and probably, you know, one of the more important pieces of this is how do you incorporate that into your curriculum um, and how does it make sense with um, what your requirements are. And the ABOS is looking at how to incorporate this possibly for accreditation and the AAOS is looking at having uh, this be part of their rock curriculum, um, but not quite there yet. This is, these two screenshots are from Precision OS, which is um, Danny Bowles, um, who was an ortho who is an orthopedic surgeon, um, VR system, and they've uh, recently introduced a curriculum. And in that, it shows you know for each module which PGY levels it's best for, <clears throat> and they've mapped it to the ACGME milestone. They've also done that for CanMeds because it's a Canadian-based company. Um, so this isn't validated, but I do think it's really interesting how you can map this you know to your curriculum, to your rotations uh, conceptually and see where that'll be the most valuable. Um, so lots of opportunities to incorporate this. Um, you know, Again, just like the others that we talked about, you can do a learn mode and then a test mode. Um, there are a lot more metrics that come with this. Anything importantly is it should be part of the curriculum if you're going to use it, um, because we found that even though VR is fun and when you first uh, get it, people wanna try it and play with it, um, but everybody's super busy. And so if it's not a requirement, the use falls off. Um, and so figuring out how it works best, um, you know, either as a requirement before a lab or a requirement um, before going to the OR to generate that discussion. Uh, the faculty member can look at what your metrics were and say, all right, this is what we're going to work on today. You can break it into those component parts. You know, I see you did a really good job um, with the approach and getting your starting point, um, but we're going to work on, you know, your interlocking screws or whatever. Um, one of the big questions that always comes up is the cost. Uh, really with any of these systems, but with the VR, the hardware costs have come down um, and they probably will continue to come down, but they're about $300 to $500. The most expensive cost is the system itself, which is about $5,000. Um, there was one study from uh, Danny Bull and his colleagues um, in JAMA Network uh, that compared this to the operative time that it would take to get and learn the same uh, information. Um, and they also threw in if you sent your resident to a course and they found that the immersive VR system was at least 34 times more cost effective. Again, I think that's a reach, but it, it's interesting and it is um, cheaper than a lot of the cadaver work or um, big simulators that have been used in the past. So a consideration. Um, I think one exciting um, opportunity with VR uh, is to improve global education on um, this paper up here in the corner is from the GYN literature, and it talks about using a VR simulator uh, to allow trainees in Zambia to practice hysterectomy, um, because you can have a, a teacher in one place and a learner in another place and be teaching. Um, so I think there's a lot of potential with that. Intersurgeon is a neurosurgery organization <laughs> that provides an AR software called Help Lightning, which helps to facilitate um, VR consultation in real time uh, intra op consults across distances. Um, so I think, you know, I'd be interested in what Dr. Shapira and Dr. Sabatini think, but I think there is potential uh, for this really 
to contribute to opportunities for global education as well. Um, so in a short summary of this, um, you know, using uh, VR or immersive VR as an opportunity for patient-free, risk-free learning, uh, you can practice many times until proficiency, and it may actually get you to that proficiency in a group press time um, because you don't have to wait for all those cases to come up. <laughs> it can provide a ton of metrics and objective measurements um, and track progression and help to personalize education and self-directed learning. Uh, it's most effective if it's a requirement to some extent and curriculum-based. Tons of future capabilities, one uh, um, opportunities to load patient-specific data so you can put the patient's CT in and actually practice uh, that specific complex surgery um, and certainly plenty of limitations as well. The haptics are improving, but there's a lot of room for improvement, um, lack of standardization. And I think there's a lot of effort on that side now. Um, and then the cost component. Uh, so for the last few minutes, I'm going to talk about some artificial intelligence applications that may change uh, the future of medical education. Uh, based on a framework of something called precision education, which is espoused by the AMA. Um, and this is based on recognizing challenges to learning outcomes because our current medical education system um, is not really personalized. And you know, just like these cartoons here, uh, every resident is not the same as the next person, right? Um, and so precision education, similar to precision medicine, <clears throat> aims to promote an individualized approach to optimizing education. It supports a growth mindset. It uses the resources of AI um, and machine learning, as well as electronic patient record, and tries to you know put all of this together um, to optimize what we can provide. So I'm going to give a few examples that are being used in internal medicine now. Um, so we have real time access um, from our electronic health record to what diagnoses um, trainees are seeing, and we can use this uh, to tailor educational resources uh, to them. And so there's a natural language processing system that can map um, high quality education based on the diagnoses. And for example, the trainee can do a note and then they'll get this in response. And so this is an example for somebody who saw a patient with acute kidney failure. Um, but you can imagine if we did this in orthopedics, uh, the letter might say, hi there, Camille Sullivan, you recently wrote a note in Epic for a patient with a diagnosis of compartment syndrome. And then it gives these flyouts and links to educational resources and to current literature. Um, and this would just happen automatically. Um, so, and another example uh, is looking at consult notes and clinic notes. And we know that trainees author hundreds of clinical patient notes each year, uh, but get very little feedback on their you know, clinic notes. But there are good clinic notes and there are bad clinic notes or good consult notes and bad consult notes. Um, and that makes a difference. Um, so Shea developed a natural language processing system that automatically reads the notes that are put into the electronic patient record and gives precision feedback on the quality based on you know, a battery of notes that have been reviewed before. So is it a good note? Is it a bad note? How can it be better? The trainee then has a personal, dash personal dashboard that shows them the quality of their notes by diagnosis and type, and they can um, compare themselves to others and track their progress over time. And then the program director or faculty get a broader dashboard that show everybody and where they're at. Um, and you can look at all the trainees and you can target areas for overall improved education to the program um, or to individuals, which ultimately should improve patient care and patient outcome. And then uh, one final example that's being piloted at the University of Rochester is using an AI application to identify the conditions and diagnoses that trainees are seeing. Um, and they're mapping it to the American Board of Internal Medicine categories. But you can imagine if we did this in orthopedics, you can map it uh, to the ABOS cases. You could correlate it with um, your surgical skills feedback. Um, and this helps the trainee know if they're seeing an appropriate breadth and depth of cases. It can help the program to see if there are areas um, that the residents are not seeing enough of and then maybe uh, adjust education based on that or adjust rotation. So interesting. Um, so in summary, every learner or trainee is different. They come with different data, different understandings, different learning styles, um, and that needs to be considered in optimal teaching. Technology and innovation can help. Um, it can help to augment learning, put the learner further on the learning curve to get the most out of the time in the operating room, provide an opportunity uh, to practice and repeat, um, give that data-driven, individualized feedback and this in turn can help to facilitate lifelong learning 
optimize education within the constraints of an 80-hour work week, um, and ultimately improve um, patient care and outcomes. And you know, over the course of time, we will continue to have new innovations that improve and challenge traditional uh, and current models of medical education. And rising to that challenge as orthopedic educators requires adopting a growth mindset and being open to adapting to face the changing needs and expectations of not just our patients, but also of our trainees. Uh, thank you. These are our resonance. And these are things I didn't touch on, but that are also important. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Laporte. That was great. Great ideas for what we can add to our program. And I think we do have some time for questions. Uh, I'll start Hello. I'm sure everybody about, I mean, just incredible uh, wealth of opportunity and uh, technology that's going to have a, have a big impact. I think we can all feel that. But as, as we get started in this and you're, you're an expert um, and uh, in your program, how do you create alignment so that there's a, an impetus, um, a reward for, for using these tools. You know, we've forayed into OrthoBullets, JBJS tool. The usage is quite variable in our training program by the trainees and the trainers. Um, any, any tips about how to promote this and avoid the churn and get the best part of it? Yeah, so that's a great question. We just, we struggle with that as well. I think, um, Heavy. So, you know, for example, with the knowledge resources like ortho bullets, what I guess we found has worked the best is having some accountability. So we have a one day of education, like maybe you guys do that today. Um, and so doing there's a monthly milestone test. So we do that once a month with all of the residents together um, and then they get feedback. So having having some buy in from the faculty is important, too. Right. If you're just asking the residents to do it, but nobody's checking it or giving them some feedback. Um, that's harder. Um, I do think it gives you a report how you compare it to other PGY, you know, threes or fours or whatever your year is. So instead of just getting that one report out for the in training, that's a helpful incentive. That being said, certainly as we get closer to boards, we see a, a huge uptick in use um, by the senior residents. Um, so I think you know, having some accountability and um, giving feedback is helpful with the VR. We're just starting to really incorporate that outside of our entrance skills. And I think you need, I think we're doing this. Uh, we have a VR champion. Um, so, you know, a faculty member who is really interested, enthusiastic, and is going to sort of own selling that. Uh, we are um, going to have a curriculum with it. And you're going to have to be checked off before you do certain procedures, not, um, not to a week, like with the ADOS skills assessment. Um, so starting slowly um, and starting with really common procedures, and we're hoping that that will catch on and also give us an idea of how valuable it is. Um, so yeah, I don't have a perfect answer, but I do think there's got to be a you know faculty component to it um, and somebody checking in and feedback. Great. I think just um, to kind of, I guess be devil's advocate, you worry about having too many resources for residents, right? So there's JBJS, there's res study, there's ortho bullets, and then it's how do you determine what's best for your learning style? How do you learn best? But then on top of that, with the BR, and then with duty hours the way they are, I was worried that are we asking them to do this extra outside of their already eight hour work week? Is that inundating them with too much information? And then how do you balance that with life and other responsibilities. Yeah. So that's really important. And that's why I, I think like we've built these quizzes into the protected time. So it's part of their duty hours and they're all there together. I think that VR would have to be in that too, right? There's so much responsibility as a resident. It's hard to fit it all in that time, but it's also not, um, I don't think it's okay to ask for that to be done on your own time. Now, figuring out which learning resource is best is to that one size fits all thing. And it's tough because rest study, you can only buy for a whole program. Um, and the academy doesn't make it easier either. Like you can't buy, you know, one of your residents is one system and somebody else is different because they don't allow that. So um, either you figure out what works best for your program 
or hopefully this um the aos rock will end up being the be all end all resource that they want it to be um and that'll have that consistency across programs that's rolling out this year um we'll wait and see but it, um their goal is that that's gonna meet all of the needs I'm excited to see what Rock shows. I wrote a really interesting chapter on psychiatric illness in Japan, so I'm sure everyone will read that when it comes out. <laughs> um, my question um, kind of uh, adds on to Dr. Vale's, but um, not just from like a faculty champion standpoint. Can you talk a little bit about how your program utilizes staff to help out with this? Um, we have three outstanding members of our educational staff that help with all of our educational stuff. Um, but that includes everything from medical student through credentialing fellows and, you know, everything in between. And I'm wondering if you have like certain roles that somebody is helping with this and somebody is helping with that and how you utilize them. That's great. And I'll ask you about your three people later because I think we need more people uh, in our program. We have um, one medical education coordinator who also is our program coordinator. And as you all know, that that's your go-to person for so many things. Um, but we do have that person uh, oversee the dashboard um, for the ADOS and all the skills and behavior. And the goal was to have that oversee um, also for the VR, just you know, not to check metrics, um, but for completion, right? So that somebody's seeing that it happens, somebody's seeing that those two evaluations come in, um, you know, every week and then we might be keep up. Um, you know, uh, it, ideally, so. Um, I know in the HSS program, um, they're using VR um, and their coordinator is a PhD in education and she runs their VR classes. Um, so having somebody with a, not, with a knowledge and understanding can be really valuable for that because there is a lot of data um, and just for somebody to manage that. And then it's very easy uh, for your program director to say, you know, I want to see, you know, Brian's feed on X, Y, or Z. Um, and then instead of, it, it should be at your fingertips, but they can just send you a screenshot. You can look at it on your phone and then generate a discussion in the OR. Um, so I think having an education person or an administrative person with some knowledge and ownership of it is really important to the success. And also for troubleshooting, right? You know, this is computer technology. Things don't always work, right? Somebody's password doesn't work and they, you know, then they can't progress and do what they need to do. And, you know, you're in the OR, so you can't help them. So having uh, a daytime resource is helpful too. We have um, VR on both, but, you know, on different campuses. I think that's helpful. Um, if you're gonna use it, having multiple headsets is helpful too. Hey, Dr. LaPorte, thanks for the um, the talk. And I had a kind of a question slash comment. I think the there's a lot of focus on the ADR work week. And, and I think that's kind of an, and there's a lot of focus on how do we get technology to help us get more clinical training within that work week. But I think that focus is a little misguided sometimes because it's not the 80 hours, but the effectiveness of those 80 hours. That word, I think technology can make a huge difference where it's instead of using AI to simulate surgery, if we use AI to do all the different tasks that residents are required to do outside of surgery, you have actually more time to do the surgery. For example, you wake up, you're looking at texts of consults from overnight, then you're rounding on patients, sending an email, then you're sending texts to attendings, then you're talking to the front desk and you're talking to implant people. And in that time, you could have just been preparing for your case instead. Um, and AI can do all of that for you, right? You can, AI can generate all the consults, all the pertinent imaging and give it to you in one email and have all the attendings on it for all the consults overnight, right? They can, AI can look through the entire next day's clinic be like, these are the, you know, patients that are new patients that are coming in with this imaging and that's your prep for clinic. And that took AI five seconds and you read through the email and you're ready. And I feel like that can be such a good impact. Um, and then you have the time to be like, the attending is now free and you're free. And you're like, let's talk about the case. Let's go through step by step. And then we'll go and do the case rather than you're running around in the wrong direction. I think that improves the 80 hour. It gives you more effective time in that in those 80 hours you know, i get rid of this and that's awesome that's working smarter not harder right um and i agree you want to optimize your 80 hours at work so are you using that at all we actually do use ai for our patient list 
not for notes yet, although my uh, multiple residents have shown me how you can make a really good clinic note from chat GBT, um, better than their notes. Um, so I don't know, are you using any of that? Uh, no, none, none of that's being used. I think, I mean, but I think that's, that's where it can go. And, and I think that can make a lot more impact than some of any of some of our other measures, because, you know, you can substitute all of that for real blood and bone and surgery time and, and prep time. Uh, and then I think that's just, it'll be a more effective way. And I think it's coming soon. You know, I mean, like, like you're mentioning about chat GPT and everything. I, I think it's not too far away. We just have to be able to harness it. I think that sounds fantastic. Right. And, you know, I'm not saying you should spend all your 80 hours doing VR. You should do enough that when you get to the OR, you're optimizing that time and you're just in a better starting place when you get there and you're going to get more out of your interaction, um, with the attendee and they're going to give you the knife, um, you know, sooner and for longer. Ideally, maybe yeah. One last question, and then we'll wrap up. Um, and that's the report. Um, my question is meaning on like looking at the like long term outcomes of some of these things. More of like, uh, I think as somebody interested in, in sports and help with the arthroscopy skills lab, it's definitely a great resource. But a lot of my colleagues will, will never end up using like their arthroscopy skills, and so like looking at outcomes of some of these things and how do you like monitor their progress getting your residents to proficiency and then preparing them afterwards like what kind of what do you to, like determine whether like the addition of these resources then help those goals right so um in the studies they're looking at asset scores and i think there's a need to look at long-term retention because they're really only looking at short term um so that's a really good question in our program we're really looking at subjective evaluations um, and then the resident comfort level. Um, but ideally, you know, to be scientific about it, you should use objective validated metrics. So for arthroscopy, assets been um, validated. There should um, there should be multiple rating scales. So there should be a global rating scale um, as well. And um, in some of these studies, there's also a pass fail. So that looks for sentinel errors. Um, because that's the only way that you can have a consistent metric to see if it's making a difference, um, you know. And so they're measuring um, different steps along the way. Um, All right. Um, thank you so much again, Dr. Report. This was fantastic and very much appreciated.